This video is brought to you by World of Warships. Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Mercier and today I'm at the Royal Canadian Artillery Museum in Shiloh, Manitoba, having a look at a Javelin missile. But no, not that Javelin. The one you're probably thinking of is the Raytheon FGM-148 anti-tank missile. This Javelin, on the other hand, is a manned portable air defense system, or MANPADS, developed by Short Guided Missile Systems, now Thales Defense Limited, in the 1980s. But before we get to the fascinating history and function of this missile, first a word from the sponsor of this video, World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play online game that lets you take command of some of history's most iconic warships. Choose from over 600 battleships, cruisers, destroyers, aircraft carriers, and submarines, from the legendary Yamato, Tirpitz, Iowa, and Dreadnought, to the more obscure Rio de Janeiro, Gritterbis Unitas, and Mogador. Each ship is lovingly recreated down to the last detail, with key stats like top speed, turning radius, armor protection, and the time needed to aim and reload the guns accurately represented. Battle against a massive online community in more than 40 highly detailed maps with stunning water and weather effects that put you right in the heart of the action. With each victory, you unlock ever more powerful ships, allowing you to dominate the high seas. And with new content released every month, including in-game nations, ship classes, or themed maps like Transformers, Popeye, or Godzilla vs. Kong, there's always something exciting to look forward to. From November 16th to 30th, players can participate in a special in-game collaboration event between World of Warships and the popular anime High School Fleet. At registration, use the promo code HSF2023 to receive a huge starter pack including 200 doubloons, 1 million credits, 7 days of premium account time, and 2 high school fleet commanders. Link in the description. Oh, and did I mention World of Warships is also available on console? Now, I don't normally play a lot of video games, but even I have to say World of Warships is a ton of fun, and I love the sheer variety of historical warships that you get to play. So, what are you waiting for? Like Nelson, I expect that every viewer will do their duty. Now, the story of the Javelin begins with the development of its immediate predecessor, the Blowpipe Missile, in the early 1960s. So the Blowpipe was developed by Short Brothers Limited of Belfast, who are probably best known for building flying boats during the 1930s and 1940s. And they started this as an entirely private in-house venture. But in 1966, the British Ministry of Defense put out a formal request for a manned portable air defense system. And in 1968, they awarded the contract to Short Brothers, mainly because their proposal was seen as the least expensive. However, development of the blowpipe proved difficult and dragged on for many years, to the point that by 1973, they were still doing developmental trials. And although the missile was designed to be as inexpensive as possible, it turned out to be anything but. And in 1976, there was a minor scandal when the Royal Air Force revealed that the extent of its blowpipe training was two live launchers per year because they couldn't afford to expend any more ordnance. Production was also very slow, so that by 1978, only half of the units in the British Armed Forces that were supposed to receive blowpipes had actually received them. Now, the blowpipe's baptism of fire came in 1982 during the Falklands War, where it was used by both sides. And unfortunately, it performed dismally. Of 100 launches recorded, only two resulted in aircraft being shot down, leading Brigadier Julian Thompson to quip that using the blowpipe was like trying to shoot pheasants using a drain pipe. Now, this dismal performance led to the immediate development of the Javelin missile, like this one, which was basically a blowpipe upgraded with a better guidance system and a new warhead. However, the blowpipe continued to be sold on the open market and was sold to a number of countries. And in 1986, large numbers of blowpipes were supplied clandestinely to the Afghan Mujahideen. And this was mainly done because the blowpipe was available on the open market, and thus there was quite a bit of plausible deniability in terms of where the weapon came from. Conversely, sale of more advanced weapon systems like the American Stinger missile were highly restricted. However, after a few years, Western support for the Mujahideen became a lot more open, and they were supplied with Stinger missiles and other more advanced weapons, and the blowpipes were relegated to storage. And as recently as 2012, American, British, and Canadian troops were still finding unused blowpipes in Afghan weapons caches. 
Now, production of the blowpipe ended in 1993 after some 35,000 missiles and 3,000 launchers had been manufactured. And in the end, the unit cost of a blowpipe ended up being an eye-watering $55,000 compared to only $35,000 for the far more capable Stinger. So, why did the blowpipe fail? Well, early in its development, Short Brothers decided to cut costs to not fit the missile with an automatic guidance system. Instead, the missile was manually guided to its target by the operator using a thumb-operated joystick. And this is a guidance mode known as Manually Commanded to Line of Sight, or MACLOS. And this required the operator to track both the target and the missile at the same time. And if this sounds very difficult, uh, that's because it was. And this sort of cognitive overload would plague pretty much every missile that used this system, such as the Soviet Sagar anti-tank wire-guided missile. However, while its guidance system left much to be desired, the actual engineering of the blowpipe missile was really quite clever. So what are the most distinctive features of the blowpipe family of missiles, including the javelin here, is this weird two-step, two-diameter launch tube. And that was designed to get around an engineering challenge that Short Brothers came against very early in the development process. And that was how to make guidance fins to steer the missile that A, could swivel, B, were robust enough to withstand the forces of flight, and C, could fold up to fit inside a small diameter launch tube. And they came to the conclusion that there was no easy and cheap way of accomplishing all three, so they decided to go with non-folding fins. The problem with this, however, is that these fins had to be quite wide, and this would require a very large diameter or launch tube, which would then be very bulky and heavy. So their solution to this was to move the fins to the front of the missile. Problem solved, right? Well, not quite, because you also need another set of fixed stabilizing fins at the other end of the missile. And once again, this will require a very large and bulky launch tube. So what they did was they fixed these stabilizer fins to a sliding ring that they pushed up to the end of the missile just behind the guidance fins. And when the missile fires, the missile body travels through that ring until it reaches the end, whereupon the fins are fixed in place using a heat-activated adhesive. So the missile actually assembles itself as it goes through the launch tube. And this means that only the front of the launch tube actually needs to be full diameter. The rear of the tube only needs to be wide enough to accommodate the main body of the missile. And I think that's a very clever and out-of-the-box solution to that particular problem. Now, the blowpipe system, just like the javelin here, consisted of two main components, the fiberglass launch tube, which contained the missile and was sealed for storage, and the aiming unit, which clipped onto the launch tube just prior to use. And on the blowpipe, the aiming unit contained an optically stabilized sight, a battery, a radio transmitter to communicate with the missile, and that thumb-operated joystick. And when you fired the missile, a couple of different things happened all at once. Number one, a charge from the battery would activate the missile's onboard thermal batteries. So thermal batteries were developed during the Second World War specifically for use in missiles. So one of the big problems with missiles is that they tend to sit in their launchers or their silos for very long periods of time before they're needed. And if you use a regular battery, that battery is prone to leaking or otherwise degrading so that when you go to launch the missile, nothing happens. A thermal battery, on the other hand, has an electrolyte that is solid and unconductive at room temperature, meaning it can stay in storage for very long periods of time. And when you go to fire the missile, a small pyrotechnic charge melts the electrolyte and activates the battery. So while the batteries are being activated, another pyrotechnic gas generator charge is fired, and the gas from that is used to spin up the missile's gyroscopes. Then once the missile is fully powered up, a booster or ejection motor fires and launches the missile out of the launch tube. And once the missile is four meters away from the launch tube, then the main or sustainer motor fires and carries the missile the rest of the way to the target. And there is an auto gathering feature that automatically aligns the missile with the sights during its few couple of meters of travel, after which the operator takes over and guides it the rest of the way. And the missile has four pyrotechnic flares in the rear of its tail to give the operator better visibility and allow him to guide it to the target. And finally, this brings us to the Javelin missile, which, as I said, entered British service in 1984 and is basically an upgraded blowpipe missile with a new guidance system and warhead. 
So instead of a MACLO system, this uses what's known as a semi-automatic command to line of sight, or SACLO system, where you don't have to keep track of both the target and the missile at the same time. You simply keep the crosshairs aligned with the target, and the system will automatically guide the missile to that point. So the aiming module here has a television camera and screen hooked up to a six-time magnifying optic and the operator simply has to keep the target in the middle of the television screen for the missile to be guided towards it. And this was a lot easier for the operator and allowed the Javelin to expand its performance envelope from the blowpipe's 0.5 to 3.5 kilometers to 0.3 to 4.5 kilometers. The Javelin missile also has a different warhead, so the blowpipe was equipped with a 2.2 kilogram shape charge warhead, which, while effective, needed to score a direct hit. It really didn't have much area effect. The Javelin, on the other hand, was equipped with a 2.7 kilogram blast warhead, which could be set off by impact or by a proximity fuse. It also had a self-destruct feature for whenever it lost the signal from the launcher. So the Javelin was purchased by a large number of countries, including Canada, who acquired them in 1990 just prior to the first Gulf War because it tested its existing stock of blowpipe missiles, which it acquired in 1975, and found them to all be faulty. And these were used in Canadian service by the Royal Canadian Navy and the 119th Air Defense Battery until they were retired in 2005. Now, there are a number of different versions of the Javelin produced. So, for example, there was a version of the aiming module that had IFF, Identification Friend or Foe Capability, and another that didn't. Uh, there was the single shoulder-mounted variant, as well as this triple variant here, which is known as a Light Multiple Launcher, or LML. And there were mounts developed for this for a variety of infantry vehicles, including the Spartan and the M113. There was also a naval variant known as the Sea Javelin, as well as an air-to-ground anti-tank variant developed for Lynx and Gazelle helicopters. But the most advanced version of this system was the Javelin S-15, also marketed under the name Starburst. And this was introduced in 1995, and it was basically a Javelin system fitted with the guidance system from the more advanced Star Streak missile. And this allowed existing stocks of Javelins to continue to be used after the official adoption of the Star Streak in 1997. And the Star Streak guidance system is based on lasers. And it addresses one of the big trade-offs when it comes to laser designation systems. If you want your laser system to be accurate, that is, you want to target specific points on your target, you need a narrow beam. Unfortunately, such a beam is very difficult to aim, especially if you're trying to aim at a small, fast-moving target. But if you use a broad beam in order to make aiming easier, then you lose accuracy. The Star Streak system, however, uses a narrow beam that scans back and forth very quickly to paint the target with a grid, and the homing head inside the missile actually orients itself with respect to this grid and homes in on the very center. So you get both the advantages of a wide beam and a narrow beam system. And I will hopefully talk about the Star Streak in another video because it is a fascinating missile in its own right, but that's a bit beyond the scope of this video. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I'd like to give a big shout out to the Royal Canadian Artillery Museum for allowing me to film in their galleries and to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. Now, I'll see you next time on another video where we'll look at yet more fascinating weapons and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.